My name is Jim Camp. Uh, this is the Synesthesia Press. I'm a letterpress printer. I've been doing this, uh, I actually have attained this press in about 1998. I made about eh, maybe 10 books with it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and flip it on. I'm actually adding a second color to a book I'm working on with Tosh Berman called June 1, 2014. It's a, it's a short, uh, it actually started out as um, uh, an Instagram, uh, I'm sorry, a Facebook post, uh, and we kind of turned it into a book. And it's about Tosh's reaction to getting George Martin's mail uh, that had a $5 bill and a request for a model release because Wallace, who had made the, he made the cover of uh, Sgt. Pepper. So that's what we're doing. And I'm gonna lay this second color on. This is the black title, this is the title page. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lay the second color on uh, that's basically got a little border and my little pressed chop. Let me show you really quickly. So I'm gonna do this kind of slow, but we go here, whoop, we go here, and you can see this releases, and then that's that, and then if you back up nice and slow, let's back up and I'll show you, it goes, we kinda of put it over here on this drying rack. And then, yep, watch this, I'll show you over here. Those letters actually came, uh, that was a 20, uh, 36 and 24 point condensed type, and these are all of my faces, so, like if you wanted to, this is actually a letter A. And here's an O. And these are, this is spacing material. And uh, so all these, these are called California job cases, and all of them are laid out exactly the same. They have all the letters in the same exact spots. M N H O Y P W comma. The capital letters are over here, and uh, these are the different faces I have um, for uh, hand setting stuff, as well as uh, my house fonts over here. We call them house fonts, which is California, and uh, you can see this is eight point face, so it's really small versus, here I'll show you a rare, this is a rare face, like this Parsons, which would have been used for a, um, which would have been used for like a, uh, like a title. And then, so here's an H, and that's a 72 point H. So you can see the difference between a 72 point H, and here's an H, that's eight points. back in and we're oops um dude what was my my h was actually in my end this is where watch your p's and q's comes from because p's and q's if you screw them up they get messed up <laughs> so this is a font a font is any type the face is the actual letter and it's really hard to see on this so let me go back down again to this the parsons or here's phoenix phoenix is a face and and it's a design and it looks here here's here's a phoenix h right and the reason i know it's up and down is because there's a nick here on the bottom so this is the bo actually the bottom whereas this face is phoenix this face would be um here here's cooper here's a face called cooper here's a cooper o cooper's kind of a kind of like a cartoon i don't know how to describe like a cartoon face it's kind of fat it's a fat kind of plump letter you know look how big those ends are I mean, again, they're mostly for display. You would never set a whole book in Cooper. You, you'd put a title in Cooper. And then again, check this out. This is the art of the face. So this would be like, that's an H. But it, you see how long the extender is here? They made this H different than this H over here. Again, we're just, now you're talking about different faces. So they're both H's. This would be a arty, more, you know, funky kind of art deco-y kind of, I guess. Eight. The people that design typefaces, it's an actual job. It's not, I mean, people to design typefaces. You know, off the top of my head, because you're putting me on the spot, kind of Eric Gill, I think. Uh, uh, Nicholas Koshin, uh, I think. These are all, and these faces go back, some of these faces go back five, four, three, four, five hundred years ago. Um, so uh, Times New Roman is kind of the face that everybody knows, and it's kind of the face of a, of a newspaper. Uh, and, I, you know, Bell Roman. Oh, and then here's another thing. These are called ornaments. I'm totally jumping all over the place. But if I wanted to put like a, like a, um, let's say you called me up and said, I'm a bank and I want to do something. That's actually a, a sack of money. Uh, here is, um, you know, here's, 
Henry Rollins back. <laughs> Here's a, a go kart. You know, if, we, if we were gonna do like a go kart thing, um, there's yin and yangs over here. I've used these a few times. All these yin and yangs. Uh, there's all sorts of different. You know, if I, if I was doing a border, if I was doing a fancy little separation on a wedding announcement or whatever, this is all stuff that I would pull from my ornament case. And uh, yeah, I'd have to. I'd Google um, to figure out who designed types because I, I I know Eric Gill, but I can't remember many other people. Uh, when I'm doing a run like here, I'm going to show you really quickly. I'm, I'm doing it. This is Tosh's book in pages. And I actually bought, I chopped these from the parent sheets, which were like uh, 28 by 36 inches or so. I, I forget exactly. And they would go through this chopper here. If you swing around this way, you can kind of take a look at this blade. And this, this uh, challenge uh, paper chopper is probably from 18, I don't know, 1850, 1880. And uh, it'll go through a telephone book like butter, like butter. <laughs> it'll go through, if, if I could, I, you know, if I could clean it all off and do a thing, I could take those art forms down there and go right through them in, in a matter of, you know, one pull. Well, I'm a big uh, flea market found art, found guy, and I like uh, paper and stuff like that. So I found uh, a big stack of these peachy uh, chewing uh, tobacco pouches, I guess, probably from the 40s. Um, so I uh, had a huge stack of them and I, and I banked that kind of stuff. And so what this turned out to is something I've, I did, um, and it's actually a thing called two excerpts, um, uh, from Charles Bukowski and they came from post office and factotum. So you pull it out this way, I hand set all this stuff. And then when you open it this way, it's actually an excerpt from post office and an excerpt from factotum that have to do with chewing tobacco, believe it or not, tobacco <laughs> that I found in the stories. And then on this side is um, what we call the colophon, which is the information, you know, the, the addition, who did it, that sort of a thing. And then it just goes back in here. And these ended up at uh, my friend Johnny Bruton's got a thing called Bagazine. And these are gonna go into Bagazine and I've got a few left over. So there you go. So Wallace Berman is a tremendous influence on my, uh, all my work, and he kind of coined this phrase, art is God is, uh, I'm sorry, art is love is God. This is Volta, which is kind of a shameless ripoff of Semina. And uh, this is all found stuff again. Um, I found, um, the paper isn't found, but uh, I found uh, some, and I don't know, these are kind of adulty. I don't know if you could do nudity on these or not, but they're just real simple collages that I put on a S and remember the old green stamp books that I found. Um, and uh, I print these up, put them in an envelope and send them out kind of as mail art to people. Um, kind of the same ethos as uh, Semina was with Berman. Yeah. So those are those. So this is Volta four. I just showed you Volta three, which again is um, my kind of response or whatever to, uh, to Semina. And this was um, actually found, uh, believe it or not, in an adult studio. Uh, I found a booklet and what looks like these crazy kind of ramblings of, um, you know, I don't know if it's shorthand or if it's just, you know, someone that was on meth. <laughs> but I, I love the background image. It kind of reminded me a little bit of Cy Twombly. So I, I, I took it and I created, you know, copies of it. And then from there, I, uh, I found these two images in a flea market. It's one is uh, two hands kind of uh, adjusting. It's actually a musical. Uh, it's an instrument that uh, uh, kind of measures, I think, uh, reed instruments, or maybe it measures the reeds. And this was kind of probably some sort of either insurance ad or maybe an ad for, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, a church because you know we got that outreaching hand there. So I, I kind of like that symbol, and I threw them in some different kind of. I wear my influences kind of on my sleeve, so I like the Andy Warhol kind of aesthetic with the kind of the Cy Twombly aesthetic with the, this one was a fuck up as you can see, um, uh, kind of with the uh, Wallace Berman aesthetic. Then I kind of screwed up this middle thing, so I turned it into uh, another found image and it turned into a silkscreen print that I made. The, the actual silkscreen's on the wall over there. And uh, this is Volta 4. And I did a hundred of these and they're all hand tied and done. And there's a little call phone in the back. And I got some and I send those out to friends as well. So this is basically, uh, for lack of a better word, my inventory of type. I've got uh, four type cases, two stacked on top of each other. They each have about 12 uh, or so uh, drawers of type. These again are California 
type cases are called. They all have pretty much the same layout, every single one, although I do have some that are, are, are varied. Um, the name of the font, uh, specifically the face, is right here uh, on each one of the handles going up, as well as the size of the face. So this is a 12 point fancy bold. We've got the Barnum. You can pull these out. Now this is a little bit of a different case and you can see sometimes well this is actually how the the type came this is the side of the box so i'll pull off the box and uh, atf american type founders was a huge company up until about 1980 or so when all this kind of went away because desktop publishing came to be uh, and now it's hard to find these but i can pull out these ones up here i think are pretty empty i keep the empty ones up higher because they're lighter uh the heavier ones and the ones that are full down here like here let me pull down like here is um here, here's a here's a what's called outline. Again, a display face, 36 point outline. Here's what that looks like. And um, I have some of this next door to it. I and, and, the, and I don't even know what it's called. I actually inherited a lot of these from a printer who passed, and whose daughter said, "Please just come get this stuff out of my basement." Kaufman, which is a script font, kind of looks cursive-y. It's 18 point. Um, yeah, and then what I call, what we call a house font, because these are all my different faces, but what I generally go to when I go to setting a book or a poem, I'll do California type, which is in here. That's my house font, California. And my Californian's right here. California came from M&H, um, uh, which is still a, 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 an active foundry in San Francisco uh, by the park. And uh, you can see, Again, all the different sizes of the Californian type, as well as uh, I've got some ornaments. I've also got spacing material. You know, if you want to put spaces between lines, you got to do it with this stuff, right? So I know that's... I also have perf rule, perforation rule. This would actually, like if I was going to make a, a ticket, and I wanted the ticket to have a little perforation so they could rip the ticket off. Oh, that, I'm sorry, that's not perf let me find my peripheral. That's actually ornament, more border ornament. But I've got, I've got that as well. Um, so, and it's really heavy. These, these drawers are no joke. They're heavy. Inks, so uh, inks generally come in a couple ways. Uh, I use inks out of a tube. Uh, I also use inks out of a can. This is a Gans. Uh, Gans is actually still in business and they're in, uh, right down the street in LA. That is a Pantone green. That's a pound of ink, and I've actually used, you know, a pound would be all the way to the top. So what I would do is I would take this out on either, um, uh, on either one of these, one of these uh, pieces of paper, kind of like spatula knives, and I would kind of scoop some out of here, and I'd run it along the top of the roller, or what I would do is I'd take and dab the ink on the roller, set it down, flip the press on and the ink, the rollers uh, distribute the ink evenly. Um, so you can print your form. So these are basically what we call galley trays. And when you're working on a project uh, and you're, you know, it takes more than a day obviously to do this project, you wanna put it up in a, uh, uh, in a galley tray. So we pull out and we've got an identifier here. Uh, this is 18 point Bernard and 12 point California. It was an Alan Catlin project who's a, a, a poet up in, um, up in upstate New York. And so if I pull out this further, you can see, and you know, I need to, I need to what's called distribute that type, but this is how you'd set it up. You've, it's a mess right here, but this was Alan's poem. Um, and if I was a good letterpress printer, I'd have this back distributed in the type case, but I don't because I'm lazy. So it goes right in here and you can see I've got different projects for different things happening. These are some of these projects I actually inherited uh, they came from old, uh, an old printer because I, get, again, got this from a, an old printer. Here's, you want to see calendars? Those are calendars right there. Those are actually calendars. If I wanted to print a calendar, this is all really dusty because I haven't messed with it in a while. And then this book that I'm doing with Tosh Berman, these are what we call polymer plates, which is a different way of printing. Uh, these, this is digital printing done analog, I guess I'd say it. This was all set digitally. 
and then uh, a plate was created which you lay down into the press and we print that way as well so yeah and these are all different these are called chases these go into presses i got a lot of this stuff like i said that i inherited from other people this is a heavy one uh more line spacing so if you wanted a double space single space would be half of this um what else i'm just kind of doing a grab bag these are blocks that had old type uh in fact, uh, that's a Mackenzie and Harris thing from San Francisco. It's, um, uh, pro you know, I, I'm hard, I don't know if it was an ID thing that they put. Maybe they put these on their font before they sent them out. I don't know. On the paper that wrapped the font. Block. Um, but yeah, there's all sorts of crazy stuff in here. So this is furniture, uh, and furniture is uh, part of the imposition process, which is how I would set, I'd set these into, we're gonna do a slow turnaround this way. Oh, watch for that. And you can see how furniture lays into the bed to space out all the stuff. So this furniture will help me do what's called the imposition, which is this, uh, for lack of a better word, object, I guess, it's the imposition. It's where the type and all the stuff would go to, to print. So. so here I am, I'm printing the, the title page of Tosh Berman's book, June 1, 2014. I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna set it into the press. Uh, there's these grippers that, uh, I've got a little pedal here on the side, the grippers are gonna come up and I'm gonna nice and gently kind of bump the paper up to the very top and to the very side over here so I know it's all in alignment. And then when I know it's good, I let go of my pedals, the gripper grabs the paper, then what I do is I just kind of hold my hand, we go over, we're gonna get that red ink. The grippers let go automatically at the end. And then I pull this back and this goes over here. And then we let it dry. <laughs> so the book I'm making right now is June 1. It's actually a chapbook, technically it'd be a chapbook. June 1, 2014 by Tosh Berman. Tosh is a poet, writer, uh, Los Angelino. He's been here his whole life. His father was Wallace Berman. Uh, in fact, Tosh just wrote a memoir uh, a year or so ago that's been published by City Lights called Growing Up in Wallace Berman's World, and it's, it's awesome. Uh, this actually, part of this actually ends up in the memoir, but this is um, June 1, 2014 was a Facebook post. And I, when I read it, because uh, I'm friends with Tosh on Facebook, I liked it so much, I reached out to him and said, hey, you know, do you want to make this uh, into a, a something that people could hold, a book. And he agreed and here we are and we're making this and it's uh, essentially Wallace was on the cover of Sgt. Pepper's and this little story, this little vignette is about Tosh on the phone with his dad uh, in 1966 or so and getting a, a, a letter in the mail, a request, a model release and a $5 bill to be on the cover of Sgt. Pepper's. Uh, and is the fun part of the story I liked is how completely unfazed and in uh, no different, whatever. It's so what? Uh, yeah, it's a Beatles cover. Who cares? And uh, that's kind of how, not in a bad way, but just in this kind of interesting Wallace Berman way. Um, and it turned out to be one of the most important, most iconic uh, covers in, in the history of popular music, right? So. That's what this is all about. Wallace Berman, uh, it was a California, you know, I don't know what school you'd put him in, but he was with all those guys, Roche, uh, Wallace Berman, Keenholz, they were all doing the Ferris Gallery thing in the late 50s. In fact, Wallace had a show in 57 that the cops came in and shut down over Seminole One. Um, Wallace, uh, you know, 20th century uh, California art or just modern art in general, Wallace is, uh, um, uh, is an important figure and a huge influence of mine. So the press I'm printing on is a Vandercook 219. And Vandercook was um, uh, based out of Chicago. Vandercooks and Sons were the preeminent presses of the day. And these were called proving presses. And what essentially would happen is, uh, this is how they uh, made the newspaper. So what would happen is the, uh, the, the guy that made the linotype, uh, he'd print up the story uh, after it got done with the writer. The printer would come in here and slap it down on here. He'd do a quick proof of it. He'd send it back to the editor and they would read it and they'd make sure that uh, you know everything was spelled correct and all the punctuation was correct. And then from there it went into the big giant press that made the newspaper. So these were proving presses. And this actually came off because, here, check this out. At the very end of here, 
right here. There's a serial number. And that serial number, there's a guy that actually, these Vandercooks kind of have a, they're a cult kind of behind them. There's like the cult of the Vandercook, right? And uh, uh, so I know exactly this press came off right about the time of the depression, September of 29, according to that serial number, um, uh, according to NA Graphics and Fritz. A guy named Fritz has a thing called NA Graphics and he's uh, the historian. Uh, he's kind of uh, handing it off to Paul Moxon now, who's another letterpress printer and uh, scholar. In fact, Paul comes here and helps me clean my press and teach me about the things I don't know about this press. It's working all the little parts and stuff that uh, I don't, I'm not that much of a gearhead. <laughs> so part of the cult of Vandercooks is um, these were pretty plentiful up until about 1980 when desktops and desktop publishing and Macintosh took over uh, that world and these turned into uh, scrap heaps and a lot of people just sold them for this, the amount that the steel was worth. Um, and they're, they're still around, you can still find them. But, uh, you know, I, I bought this press in 1998. I couldn't afford this press now if I had to buy it again. And uh, this is actually, I found this later. This is supposed to go over uh, where, the, where the little motor is. I found this years later, believe it or not, on, on eBay. And uh, it now completes the press. It goes here, if you can swing over this way. It's supposed to go right in here and cover up the motor. And there's your, there's your press. So yeah. Uh. <laughs> My spelling's horrible, but I wrote, uh, you know, Woody Guthrie was a big hero, and on his guitar he had, this machine kills fascists. And, and, and that really spoke to me, because literally, um, this machine kills fascists too. In fact, you know, having a printing press like this, let's say we were in, I don't know, let's say we were in Amsterdam, and it was 1940, and the Nazis thought that I was printing anti-Nazi propaganda, uh, I, they'd fucking murder you, right? So this, in a sense, these, these really do kill fascists. So uh, variables with, with printing essentially is pressure and ink. And you gotta be really careful because you don't want to over ink a press. And, and young printers, when they're first starting this, really tend to over uh, ink presses. So I try to keep it as super light as possible. And I'm going straight out of the can, I'm not mixing this. And what I just drop, I'm gonna do is just drop a couple kisses of ink, like that's it. And then go ahead and when I, you'll watch these inks, the, 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 dab, the dabs of ink are going to kind of get distributed evenly. So I'll let this run for about five minutes, grab a drink of water, or use the restroom, whatever. And when I get back, you won't even be able to see those blobs anymore because they'll be evenly distributed and I'll get a little bit more ink on my subject. So this uh, 219 has two sets of rollers. Most presses, cylinder presses that I've seen have two sets of rollers, a bottom set, which are the, these rubber sets down here, and then these, this top set, which are, are on my press metal. So if I wanna disengage the rollers, uh, cause I'm gonna show you the bottom drum roller, I pull these up like this, and I'm gonna go ahead and push this out, and you can see this is the bottom drum roller. And this is kind of an odd press. Uh, even Paul, my friend that uh, is a real historian and a, and a true genius with these presses, doesn't know why this second roller's here. We're not sure if it was, um, you know, who knows? We don't know, but this is the general bottom roller. And you can still see where I just inked the type. There's still some smudges that haven't been completely distributed. So I can bring this back, set this down. And then again, the ink will distribute evenly. You can see the one with the, we call the worm. This is the one that goes back and forth. It kind of distributes the ink over evenly over the one, two, three, four other fixed rollers. So this is a, what's called a platen press. The press that I showed you in there, the Vandercook, is a, um, a cylinder press. This is a platen press. And essentially the, the, the letters, uh, the form would go in here and then I would just simply pull this lever and you just get a straight you know, kiss, a straight you know, boom to the paper as opposed to the roller. And then scan back a little bit. This is called a Kelsey. And, and believe it or not, these were in boys' comic books like in the, in the 50s. And, and if you went to the back of the, com the Superman comic book you read, and it says, hey, make money as, a, as an apprentice printer. You can print business cards. And essentially, you put, again, your letter form would go in here. Let me see if I, I haven't messed with this press in a while. But um, oh, where is it? Let me find it. Here it is. 
So you'd put your type in here into the chase. The chase would go into the platen like so. You'd um, go ahead and use it to connect it. And then the same thing, you'd put your paper in here. And you can see as this turns, it distributes the ink. And you can put in a business card, set a business card in. And uh, you can get these in the back of comic books. And this was like the, the apprentice uh, entry man's level into printing. This was called a Kelsey Excelsior 5x7. And uh, yeah, like I said, the mid-50s.